In this video, we're going to look at recurrent neural networks. So recurrent neural network is bidirectional as compared to a feed forward where the information is shared in one direction. And then we loop back through using back propagation. With recurrent neural networks or RNN, what we can do is update the hidden layers. Information is shared uh, back through the hidden layers, not just forward. So we're looking at a recurrent neural network. And recurrent neural networks are used for time series data. So if we're doing forecasting, and instead of using our forecasting models we've looked at so far in our previous videos, we can improve the model by adding these hidden layers into that forecast. And so that's what we're gonna do in this video. We're gonna do a time series analysis. You can use recurrent neural networks as well for thematic analysis, so analyzing text for themes, where there is a paradigmatic association. In other words, we're understanding the context and the meaning of words because words that have similar words surrounding them must mean similar things. And so the thematic analysis, or, um, and we talked about before that uses BERT, which is the bi-directional is the B in BERT. Um, and so uh, that's another thing you can use your recurrent neural networks for, and perhaps we'll have a video on that in the future. It's more complicated and uses much bigger files because we're dealing with analyzing text. Uh, so for now, we'll just look at a time series analysis. All right, we're actually gonna be looking at a special case of BERT uh, that is, well, I'll just go forward and then we'll go back. Uh, we're looking at LSTM, uh, long short term memory. And so we'll come back to what this means in a moment as we talk about first the decisions that you make when you are designing your neural network. So we have to set out a type of network. Here we're going to do a RNN and we need to decide then um, what we're going to train it on. We're going to decide about the size of our data set. We're gonna to need to decide how we're gonna split up the testing data and the training data. And the interesting thing about forecasting models is how we, we have to separate right first the testing and the training. So perhaps our testing data is going to be the more recent and we're gonna build the model over more historical information. So that could be how we're gonna separate the test and train. But the other thing is, is when we're doing a neural network, this is supervised learning, which means we have our labels or numbers and we are have our other variables we're using to predict that value. Just like when we do like a regression model, right? You're trying to predict an outcome, a number, uh, we have data that we're using to do that variables we're trying to use that prediction for. So in this case, the variable is time we're using to predict. Uh, and this an example we're going to look at here is stock price. Okay, so we have the output, which is the stock price, and then we have um, time component there. So we need to decide on the number of inputs. Our input is time. Uh, we need to decide on our output. Our output is going to be the stock price. And we need to decide how many hidden layers there's going to be. We also need to decide on the number of repetitions during training. So we said that with recurrent neural networks, that you can go back and update information in the hidden layers. But even with that, recurrent neural networks still go back through the entire uh, model. And so we have epics, the number of repetitions through our training data. The more epics, the more our model can learn from how well the previous model worked and it can tune and update itself uh, to create a better forecasting model. So we need to decide on the number of epics. We also need to decide on the activation function. And we talked in previous videos about different types of activation functions. Uh, recall that there is a binary step function where the minimum threshold is met, then the information passes through, otherwise the information is ignored or a linear activation function where the information is passed in just as it's received. And then we have nonlinear activation functions. The sigmoidal fun function we talked about before was used when we have a probability of an event, or when we have, so we would use it for the binary classification model. And we have tan functions we use when there is a strongly negative, neutral, or strongly positive classifications. So we use it for things like our um, convolution neural networks for sentiment analysis. And you can see our video on that. 
There's also rectified linear units, which variant of it's a variant of a binary and linear function. And we often see that one uh, inside in those hidden layers in the middle. And then we have a softmax, which is used for multiple label classification. Well, in this case, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be forecasting stock prices. And so to do that, one thing that we're going to do is we are going to standardize the stock price, turning it into ranging it from zero to one. And by doing that standardization or normalization method, that allows us to use the sigmoidal function, which gives us the probability of the the price and then we can convert that back into the stock price later so we can use the sigmoidal function to get out of our hidden layers to our output and then convert that back into our stock price and so this allows us then to actually standardize or normalize uh, the the data itself remember that when it comes to neural networks neural networks really need that standardization and we looked at that with our input variables in our in our other models how we normalize them we use that standard scalar to set the mean of them to zero and standard deviation to one well that's when we were dealing with our input variables being interval or ratio in this case it's our output variable that is interval or ratio and so rather than doing a standard where the mean is zero and we standard uh, standard deviation of one that's not as relevant because there's not other variables that we're wanting to compare it to. That standardization where the mean was all equal to zero in all the variables allowed us to treat those vari variables as equivalent to each other. Here we only have one output variable. So instead we're going to turn it into a zero to one scale and then we can use the sigmoidal function to help us get out. Now what we're going to do is we're actually going to look at a special case of a recurrent neural network that is called the long short term memory. So it's a special case and it is built into um, into Keras, into our TensorFlow. Uh, and so we can call it, the benefit of it is it's multiple layers all put in to uh, kind of pre-built for us. So how does this work? Well, here we have our input and our hidden layer. And the first thing that happens is we have a sigmoidal activation function. So probability and it's going to then help us decide what information to keep and what information to forget so we have what is called this forget gate here okay so what then what we do is we then have an input gate where we are going to have a sigmoidal function combined with a tan function and those two together will determine what input how much impact the the variable the time here is having on our uh, data so the idea with long and short term is about how much we're keeping that past information how much we're learning from it so how much is going into the long-term memory versus how much is short-term memory and you can see it's a combination of multiple activation functions and so then after we decide what to keep and then how much impact it has then the next piece is going to be what gets outputted. And so here again, we have our sigmoidal function and our tan function. So built into the LSTM model is multiple activation functions. So it's like multiple layers, hidden layers all in one layer. So it's allowing us to do lots of different steps to look at and it's particularly here in terms of time right how much of that information from historical information is being kept uh, how much is having an impact and then how much are we passing on so we're going to do that lstm and the idea with this kind of pre-built long short-term memory is that it helps address this gradient descent so whichever uh, hidden layers and processes that we set up we ultimately want to do is we want to minimize the error we want to find the difference between our predicted value of our stock and the actual value of our stock, and we want to minimize that. And since our output is interval ratio, we can use mean square error uh, to estimate that error. And what we're doing is we're trying to find the combination of hidden layers, weights, bias, and uh, these different hyperparameters to get us to that point at which the mean square error of the model is at its minimum. 
So you could think about it as if we kept changing the design of our forecasting model, trying to find the particular variation of the model that had the least amount of error, right? So the most accurate, each of the data points is close between where it, what we predict it should be and where it actually is. The challenge, of course, we have is that there we can get stuck in these local minimum errors. And so by using LSTM, we have more hidden layers built into our process that can help us from getting stuck. And then, of course, we also have the epics as we go through uh, that then each time are going through. And this then allows us to try to find that global minimum and a higher accuracy rate. So we're building this into our model. Okay, And so we're going to use this LSTM, which is a combination of multiple activation functions to help deal with how much information is retained. And we're doing a, a recurrent neural network because what matters is this relationship between the events. As we look at time, what we're doing is we're looking at, whereas the convolution neural network was a hierarchical design, right? We can break it into pieces. The recurrent neural network, there is this pattern and dependency uh, that we need to represent. So the recurrent neural network is used for like themes and text because one word is impacted by the other words around it and the order the words are in. And then our forecasting model, the data points, right? The order matters to the data points uh, to give them meaning and to create that model. So here, order matters uh, with these recurrent neural networks. And we need to take into consideration that order by um, deciding how much we retain from that order, from those previous points. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're going to design our neural network, which we're going to have our core layer where we input it in. Uh, we're gonna have dense layers where we implement our functions. Okay. We could decide to do things, we don't have any of those. We could decide to, um, to drop information, to flatten dimensions. Those are things that can be used. We're not gonna use the, um, We'll, uh, we'll do so we'll do our, our maximum scalar outside. So we'll do that. Uh, so we will be looking here at this time series data. So if you want to work along with us, then go to drstephpowers.github.io slash BIA. And we are here working under neural networks in our prescriptive analytics. What should the organization do? If we can then predict what's going to be happening in the future, that's going to help us decide what we should do. So lots of overlap in terms of our analytics. We're really just building on these forecasting models and these regression methods to build these neural networks. All right, so here we are in neural networks. If you click in here, what you will find is the workbook. You can open it up in uh, Google Collab by hitting the button that appears here. And you can find the data for this. We are um, we pulled some stock uh, numbers and put it into a data set here. So in fact, that data set is called AAPL. This is the stock prices for Apple. And so there's a practice set just following this. I've also pulled the stock prices for, for Meta. And these are from Yahoo Finance. So you can go and pull something else. Uh, just go into Yahoo Finance and look up a stock and you can download the historic. So here we have back to 2019. And you can see that it's stock prices for every single day that the market is open. We're going to ignore a bunch of this. We don't need the highs and the lows and the volume. We're just going to look at that closing price. Okay. So in order to access this, we take that file, we dump it into our Google Drive. And then we link to our Google Drive using this drive mount. This then means that our workbook is attached to our drive so we can pull up files. So let's import in that Apple file, which is a CSV. And what we can see here is what it looks like. So again, we're going to use the close uh, for our particular model. Now, in terms of packages that we're going to need, we need lots of packages. So let's start first with getting our data ready. We are going to do model selection train test split. This is going to allow us to separate our training and testing data. Although I think I may have not used this in this particular one. Yeah, I don't think I did. All right, you probably don't need that one because uh, I don't think I even put it in there. 
There's some ones I just put in by default because you just kind of always use them. Uh, it doesn't hurt to have them. Uh, unless they're conflicting with other packages, you can just load them in. But I don't think I actually use the terrain test split in this one. I just kind of keep it with these here. Uh, what we are going to use is the min-max scaler. Uh, instead of the standard scaler we used before, we're going to use min-max scaler. And that is going to convert our stock price here to a zero to one scale. Okay. We are going to do TensorFlow Kira's. We need TensorFlow Kira's model sequential because we're going to give it the steps in the order that we want. Uh, and so um, we want it to know that as we add components, add layers to the model, this is the sequence it's following. And we are, can choose different optimizers. These optimizers are all about how it goes about finding that gradient descent and that smallest uh, error. And I think we're using Atom, but if for, for some reason Atom is not uh, giving you consistent results as you go through each epic and uh, that it's really unstable, then try one of the other ones, okay? We are going to use here R squared to assess the model. Since we did that with our forecasting models, we might as well do it here uh, with this particular model as well. When it comes to metrics, we talked in previous videos about the different metrics options. Got to figure out what slide that is. And so which one you use is really going to depend on what type of data you have. If we have binary classification, we're looking at accuracy, precision, recall, and area under the curve. If it is a multi-label classification, we have accuracy and categorical cross entropy. Here, when we have interval ratio data, we can use mean square error, root mean square error, mean absolute percent error, or the coefficient of determination R squared. We're actually gonna have it pull the mean square error because we're gonna use that as the loss function. So we might as well look at the coefficient of determination as well. The coefficient of determination tells us the percentage of variability in the data that is explained, or that is the amount of variability in um, our input that can be explained by Amount of variability in our output variable that can be explained by the variables we're using for input. But sorry, <laughs> too much talking. Can't keep it straight. All right, so where are we? We're in our model. All right, so other things here. Uh, we are going to have um, layers. There are different types of layers we can add. We are not actually using all of these. Um, we are going to use this LSTM model, so that means we don't need the simple RNN or the bidirectional. If you are not doing an LSTM version of a recurrent neural network, then you would likely be using simple RNN or bidirectional. So those, we don't actually need them here. We could just mark them, you know, basically if you put the hashtag in front of them, then it is just looking at that as if it was a note and it doesn't install them so we could do that approach. Um, I don't believe in this particular one we have any dropout where we are dropping information. Um, you might see that in other uh, versions. So there are some here that we're, we're not using. Uh, we are going to use the dense and the LSTM I believe are the ones that we're focusing on. Flatten and dropout. Uh, so if we just go back <clears throat> to other layers so the dropout will set the percentage of activations to zero. This will help with reducing overfitting in the model. So if we're trying to address the overfitting uh, like we did with lasso and ridge regression, we could have a hidden layer that is a dropout. If we're trying to reduce the dimensions down, then we would have flatten. Um, we see that more with the convolution layers. So there are other options here that you can include. We went through those in a previous video. So you can choose some different options for that. And we're just really gonna focus here as we're doing just simple is dense and then we're doing that LSTM one. Okay, let's go in. So let's load that. So let's start with pre-processing our data. So first of all, we wanna know is how many data points do we actually have? So the length of that data set is 1,259. So what I wanna do is pull some out to be the test data. So why don't we take the first thousand to be the training data we build our model on and then that will leave the remaining 259 most recent data points uh, to be the test. So we can see whatever model it builds for the past, well, how well does that carry on into the more recent future? 
So we're going to split the test and train this way. Uh, so that means we're actually not using this train test split. When there is not this time series component to it, then you can use that test train split like we did with our um, with the other uh, models, neural networks that we've looked at, because in those cases, we're randomly collecting what's in the training and what's in the testing. And here, when I have that time series component, I might as well separate it out so that there's the old data that builds the model and then the new data for carrying it forward. All right, so when I do that, what I get then is the length of the test, as we said, is the remaining 259 points. In order for this to work, we need it to have a particular shape. So we're going to use NumPy to reshape our, um, our data set here. So we're going to take our training data and we are going to reshape it. What we're doing essentially is going to be adding this extra dimension to it. And so we have the thousand um, data points here, which is the value of the stock for those first thousand periods. And then we've added just a one to all those so that we have a two dimensional data. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to turn our stocks, which if we look at some of the original stock prices here at close, 52, 50, 49, what we're gonna do is turn that to a zero to 100% number. And so we're just rescaling it. And this allows us to use that sigmoidal activation function for that and helps us deal with uh, when we have interval or ratio output. So a good idea to use the min-max scalar with interval ratio output. I'll show you in a minute how you can convert it back once you have your prediction from your model. I can turn that back into the actual stock number. All right, so we are going to do that. Did I already run these? Can't keep track. All right, no, okay. Okay, so we're going to scale it. Now what we're going to do is we need to separate out what is going to be the X values and the Y values. So we do a forecasting model. Typically the X value is the time period and the Y is then the stock price you are predicting. In this case, because our bidirectional model and our LSTM is already taking into consideration that time component, we're actually going to specify what is the Y data as pulling out 50 of these data points from that training data. And that'll be our Y and then the rest will be our training data. Okay. Let's make sure we got that here. So we took our training data and we have pulled out 50 of that. Okay. All right. Now what we need to do is we need to have it be an array for it to work in the model. So we're going to take our X train and Y train data and turn it into an array. That's the next step. Okay. And then we're going to reshape this so that it's ready to go into the model. Cause as we do some of this, um, formatting here, we lose some of that shape. So let's just look at here. Y train dot shape. So what we can see here, we have, I might have gone the wrong way. Let's see, X train dot shape. This should be the 50. There we go. All right, so our X train shape is going to be this three dimensional here where it has that extra 50. Uh, and then our Y train is just the uh, 950. So sorry, I've gotten them mixed up. So we're putting this 50 here is going into that train, into the X as opposed to the Y. All right, so let's pre-process the data set here, the testing data set now that we have done the training data set. So we're gonna do the same kind of thing to the testing data set and that's so we can use it later. So we're gonna see the same kind of steps. We'll reshape it so that we get this two dimensional space. We will convert our test data into that scalar zero to one. We're gonna create these empty lists. We're going to pull out 50. And what that means then is that after we convert it to a numpy and reshape it, then the X test 
has this three dimensions to match this X train, where we have that 50 that have been pulled here. Uh, and then our Y test should have the same dimensions as that Y train. So you can see that we're at 209 instead of 259 because those 50 have been pulled over here. Uh, just like this is 950 instead of 1000 with the 50 that's pulled aside. So this is helping to deal with um, the difference between the X and Y, what are you using to predict and what are you predicting? And so, sorry, I misspoke previously, but there's really this extra 50 units here that it is using to um, help predict the Y. So we have the time series, but then we also have the 50 um, stock prices that have been pulled out to help train. And then same thing here with the test, we pulled out 50 of them out of the 259 that will help in terms of the inform, at least the starting point, right? So if we're looking at stock prices, yes, we have time, but we also kind of need to know where generally the stock is at. Um, and so pulling out those 50 and putting them in to help build the model uh, then helps uh, with that as well. So that's what that pullout is there. All right, so let's build our model. Our model, we're going to load sequentially. Okay, so here it allows us to add our layers that we want. We're using the LSTM layer and we're actually gonna do the LSTM layer twice. The more times you add it, then the more it's going to learn. So from the more epics we have, of course, it's gonna learn by going through so let's just go back to here, okay. So we learn from epics. We learn from going all the way through the, from the input all the way to the output and then looping back around. That's how the model improves, helps minimize that error. We're also improving the model by having more activation functions. And this LSTM, as we said, was built in with multiple activation functions in a forget input output a gating process where it is deciding how much information to keep, then how much impact does the information have, and then how much gets passed on. So forget input and output, and you can see that they are a combination of sigmoidal activation functions and tan activation functions. So we're actually gonna have two of these built into our system to help it learn even more, okay? Now we're going to do that, we're gonna load it in, your first layer always needs to specify how you're going to input it and what shape it has when you input it. So that's why we found this X train shape earlier. Okay, so we're going to simply pull that here and we are going to have the shape, ah, where did you go? No, come back here. Okay, then the other piece here is that we are doing an LSTM and then we need to decide in terms of how big is the space? How big is that output space? Well, because we, we pulled out these kind of 50 um, uh, stock prices to start with to help it learn from, we'll start with a space that is that 50. Uh, and so the idea here is we're kind of doing batches where it's going to learn in chunks. All right, so we're going to have it um, look at it in kind of groups of 50 is what it's going to be doing by having us pull out that 50 as well as have that 50 here. And then we're gonna do this LSTM twice. We don't put the input shape in the second layer. You only put it in the first. This return sequence is true or false is about that ability to stack the LSTM. So because we wanna be able to stack a second one on top, this one says true, no more stacking, this one says false. Okay, this allows us to put them on top of each other. And then we can have a dense function here. We, when we are doing, we talked about in terms of our output space, what we need to do when we are doing non-image based, those output spaces get smaller. And so we're, we're simplifying, as we learn, we're simplifying uh, to that solution we want. And the solution we want is a number um, for our forecasted stock price. We want a forecasted stock price. And so that's why we're gonna end up here with dents of one. And we're going, we've converted it to that, um, we're using 
my mind has gone blank. We are using here this um, min max scalar, right? We turn it to zero to one, which means that we can use a sigmoidal activation function to leave that to leave that space. So you can play with this. You could change this density if you want. Uh, we're just basically moving down, so 50 and then half of 50 and then down to one. You could add more layers. Um, and you can add other types of layers. So if your model is not very accurate, you can change the complication of the layers. And part of playing with neural networks is to kind of learn what are better layers and what are kind of general rules of thought in terms of what makes a good layer. Here, we're gonna do a very basic model. So we have our LSTM. We are going to then convert it down to one forecasted stock price, which is right now scaled between zero and one. And then we're going to, after we, I ran that, okay, let's do this. Now we're going to compile. We're going to use Atom as our optimizer. Again, you can use one of the other two instead. Our loss function, how we're going to measure the error is MSE. And our metric is going to be R squared. That's because we're already seeing the MSE, so why put it there twice? And so let's do that. Let's compile. Then we need to pick our number of epics. And so just recognize the more epics you have, the longer it's gonna take. Uh, the more complicated the layers are, the longer it's gonna take. Uh, here, we'll start with 50, we'll see how it goes. And um, if it hasn't learned enough, we can always do more. All right, let's start here. When it comes to the number of epics and the complication of your neural network, we are limited, right? Google Collab only allows so much uh, bandwidth memory um, to actually uh, do this analysis. And so if it takes too long or requires too much computing power, uh, then Google Collab will just time out on you. If you have a very complicated model, then you should move out of the Google Collab space. So maybe you're using, um, uh, what is this? Um, my mind has gone blank, a Visual Studio, Microsoft Visual Studio, uh, and running your Python code there where it's on your device as opposed to on the internet. Um, so the other piece is, is since we are teaching uh, these tools or learning these tools, nobody wants to sit here for 20 minutes while we're waiting for it to go through 3000 epics. Uh, so here we're gonna go through 50, but it's still gonna take some time. Right now we're at 58 seconds. So I'm gonna pause the video, we will resume once we get through our 50. So our 50 epics took one minute and 23 seconds. As we look at the mean square error, we can see it's quite small. Remember, of course, that mean square error, the size of it's actually gonna be dependent on what type of numbers you're using. So if we did have numbers that were 50, 1,000, 20,000, then the mean square error number is gonna be a bigger number just in general, even though we're looking for it to decrease over time or decrease as we go through the epics. Uh, in this case, because we have taken our data and turned it from our numbers for our um, stock prices, they were at $50 and now it's down to between zero and one, the loss numbers themselves are automatically gonna be super low uh, because the number is only between zero and one. And so we still want to go down, but just, you know, just because this number is, uh, is a super tiny number, doesn't mean that this model is say better than a different neural network model we used where the mean square error was 50, right? It's cause it's on a different scale. Mean square error is on, is really dependent on how that variable, that output variable is being measured. But we look at the R squared, it's a percentage. So it's the amount of variability that's been explained by the model. So here we're looking at 99%. So looking like it's pretty good, at least for the data we put into it. So what we wanna do is we can look at the details of our model. We didn't do this in previous neural networks, but we probably should have. Whatever you name it, not model, or we've been naming it model, but if you type in model.summary for whatever neural network you're doing, if you're using um, Keras and TensorFlow, then it will provide this summary here that will show you the output space. We started with an output space of 50. We're reducing it down as we go to that final um, number. And you can see the number of parameters that it's considering, which is gonna be very much a function of that output space. And it shows you all the different layers. So it's going to help kind of summarize what it is you asked for in those layers if you call that summary. 
But what we want to know is how well this model works. So we could um, evaluate the model using our train, our training data. So we could take X train, Y train, and we could then see how well that fits. And so this is 99% in terms of explaining the variability. Now this should be high because this was used to train the model. What really matters is how well the model works for the test data that we withheld. Now, in order for this model.evaluate to work, we have to have processed the test data the same way we trained data, which is we did that min-max scalar and we adjusted it in terms of the number of dimensions. We took the 50 points um, and or 50 data points and set them aside to help uh, build the model, not just the time series component. So that's why we need to have it formatted the same so that you can run this particular line of code. We can see that for that new data, so forecasting to the future, this here is 85% accurate. Our R squared of 80% is what we're looking for, 80% or higher. If you get too high, our concern, of course, is overfitting. Um, and if you're overfitting, there's going to be a big disparity between these two R squareds in terms of the data used to build the model and the future model. These aren't that far off. They're both above 80%. We're pretty happy with this model. All right, well, how do we actually go about using it? Well, what we can do is we can take data and we can use the model to predict our Y values. So for example, if we take this test data and we put it into the model and get our Y predictions, and then we call that information, what we see here are a bunch of percentages. That's because we did the min-max scalar, so it has taken and predicted a stock price, but as a percentage. So in this case, we need to undo that, and we need to go back to the original stock price. To do that, we do scalar.inverse transform. So scalar.inverse transform will then put it back to a um, stock price. So this will inverse whatever the transformation we already did was. All right, so now we look at, here is what it looks like, AAPL pred. And so, if we go back in time. So we can see here, this is what it's predicting for our stock prices. Okay. All right, now, what does that do? We have, in that prediction, we have 209 predictions because we pulled out 50 of those, right? Now, let's plot that. First, we want to do is we want to look at what has happened to our loss function. If we have a good model, that loss function, remember that mean square error is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller, and it should plateau once it finds that global minimum. So let's import matplotlib.pyplot as plt. And let us plot that. So we're going to plot. We called the fitted model. Sorry, we go back. And farther back. So you see how we named this model fit results? That's so we could call the history later. So if you just did model fit here and didn't call results, we would still see the same stuff but we want to actually name it so that we can call back the history of the loss function. So we're gonna plot, using our matplotlib.pyplot, we're gonna results history loss, labels equal loss, uh, the x-axis is the number of epochs, we did, what did we do, 50? Uh, and the y-axis, you can have it say error, or mean square error if you wanna be specific. We can turn the legend off. Right now it just says loss. But you can see here's our gradient descent. We don't see that it's getting caught in uh, different uh, local minimums that seems to be finding the bottom. And we can see it kind of flattens out. If it doesn't look like it's quite flattened out, you can add more epics, right, to make sure you really are at that minimum point. We're highly accurate with our 50 epics, so we probably don't need any more. But now we want to know, okay, well, what, what does this look like? What does this forecast model look like? So let's take our Apple 
and we're going to take our training data, that was the first thousand points, right? And we are going to plot that training data before this, all we did the min-max scalar. So we'll plot the original training data, the first thousand points, and we'll do an index here where it does those first thousand points. Then what we're going to do is remember the whole data set was 1,250, I don't know, 59, something like that. What we're going to do then is we're going to say, okay, well, let's take the data we had separated to the test and train. So maybe I'll just go back here to the very beginning. Okay. So what you remember is that we took this 1,259, we made the first thousand be the train, the last 259 was the test. So we're going back to this original data before we did any kind of processing to it, before the min-max scalar, before pulling out any 50, all that stuff. So we're gonna take the train and test, that's gonna be the actual data. Oh my goodness, okay. So here we are plotting in B, that's blue. In blue, this is the training data, so it's the actual data from the first thousand data points. And then what we're gonna do is we're going to plot the actual data from the stock, but it was the 259 that we set aside to be the test data. So we're gonna label that in black. And we really need to fix these labels because this is going to be the train, this is the test. We'll remove the labels entirely. And then what we're going to do is we are going to take our predicted that we just turned back. We used, we undid or inversed that scalar. Uh, and that was, and that we're going to take those 50 points. And what we're going to do is we're going to put them here on top of the test data. So we want to see is how well our prediction compares to the test. And we want to see how well it fits into that bigger picture of what's happening with the stock. So that's what this graph is showing us here. Okay, so what this is showing us here is the first thousand data points in time. Here is the data. We can see the stock price of Apple going up substantially from that $40, $50 all the way up to $160. And then break it here. The black was what we used for our test data, so it was not included to build the model. And then here in red is what uh, the model predicted. So we can see why it is so accurate, uh, is that it was able to actually predict this variability here, even though all it had was the blue to build the model. Okay. So we've gone through the whole process. I know this is a super long video and my apologies, but you can take this data now for a different data set, a different uh, forecast, and build a forecasting model, play with the epic, play with the hidden layers, make them different, add additional layers. Uh, can you improve the model? How accurate is your model? And since we're doing forecasting our time series, we might as well end it with a graph that shows our forecasts.